Rappers are known for their insane rises and falls, but these days it seems like there's a new rapper that pops up every week. And some of the most explosive of these rappers are meme rappers. Meme rappers are rappers that blow up because of their memes, not because their music is good. And they tend to fall faster than anyone. Over the past 5 years or so in the internet era of rap, many meme rappers have risen to the top of the internet and made some serious waves in rap, only to fall off. But why does this always happen and why were they not able to enjoy long careers? Well, that's what we'll be answering today. My name is Rishav Ashir and this is Meme Rappers Who Fell Off. The first meme rapper who fell off is none other than Ugly God. Back in 2017, everybody loved Ugly God and his music. He was funny, his music was catchy, and overall, he was just a cool guy. But let's take it back to where it all started. Ugly God grew up in Houston, Texas and always had a passion for music, beginning to rap in middle school. His first song to give him some traction was a meet, which went semi-viral and put him on the map. But that didn't blow him up. In 2017, he dropped Water. Water wasn't just a meme song. It was huge and catapulted him to internet fame and in the process made him a household name in rap. At the time, meme rap was really new so people really thought Ugly God could go the full 8 yards and go mainstream off of water. On top of that, Ugly God was exceptional at marketing himself. He used to put lizards on his nose and it would make fans go crazy. That year, Ugly God was featured on the XXL freshman list and in October, he signed a deal with Asylum Records for close to a million dollars. He was going crazy, performing at huge festivals, selling out shows, and getting features from other big rappers. He's living his best life. And at his peak, he even moved in with Ricegum, Baze Banks, Alyssa Violet, and the infamous Clout Gang in their Clout House. So it's safe to say things were going pretty good for Ugly God. But in rap and in entertainment in general, there's a saying that you're only as good as your last piece of work. And Ugly God would only be able to ride the success of water through 2017. After that, he had to come out with another hit, or he would begin to decline. But like anyone, Ugly God began cooking up his next move. He decided to drop a diss track called F Ugly God and tried a number of tactics to get another hit, followed by his debut album. In the middle of the year, Ugly God dropped the booty tape, landing number 27 on Billboard and had a Wiz Khalifa feature. But despite the mild success, it wasn't the type of success he had received with Water. A huge blunder of his with the booty tape was fumbling a ski mask and XXX Tentacion feature. This would have been a huge moment for him. Ski mask, the slump god, was supposed to be on the booty tape. Yeah. What happened with that? Um. I guess label issues, clearing issues, him and X were on, this, were on the song and uh... The booty tape had no hits and these features would have guaranteed a hit, even a classic. But Ugly God got into beef with X. What exactly happened with you and XXS and Tacion? Cause I mean, I'm looking, we did an article about you. I mean, bro, everybody tell me you finna summon a demon. I don't believe you can, but if you can, don't. We got into about some sh and then uh... You know, he was a real emotional kid, but me and him really just kind of went back and forth, and I was just like kind of picking at him. So he never dropped the version with Ski, and X didn't record his verse. And to add to that, nothing else Ugly God tried worked either. So the question popped up, would Ugly God ever overcome water, or would he remain a one-hit wonder? But the booty tape flopping wasn't the end of the world. Anyone could come back from a minor flop after having such a major hit like Ugly God did. However, to the surprise of everyone, Ugly God didn't try to make a comeback. Instead, he decided to go on hiatus. The following year, in 2018, Ugly God stepped back into the shadows. Prior to that, he was super active on the internet, constantly checking in with fans, dropping music, doing interviews, but all of a sudden, he became very reserved. The only time he was seen was his feature on Lil Gotti's album, and fans weren't sure why. On the XXL list, Ugly God was featured alongside artists like Playboy Cardi, XXXTentacion, PNB Rock, and A Boogie, artists that would all go on to become massively successful in the coming years. So why did Ugly God's career turn out any different? Well, one of the main reasons why Ugly God fell off so fast was because he was really young and didn't know how to handle all the fame. My fan base was growing so like steadily and organically. Mm. And then like just looking at my fucking my numbers, which I fucking hate going by numbers, but sometimes it matters and like going by numbers and like as far as my followers and like my analytics and stuff, as soon as XXL happened, that shot the fuck up. I bet. And it was crazy. I, I feel like I didn't get my core fan base where I wanted it to before, you know, that. So to him, he felt like he was growing too fast, too soon, which stunted his career. And all this stress would cause Ugly God to fall into depression. It turned out Ugly God was clinically depressed. It was a combination of fame coming at him too fast and personal issues in his life and he'd speak on it himself saying I was super depressed for a whole year and no one even noticed, but it's okay. I shouldn't expect y'all to care about my personal life. I'm here just to be a good friend and deliver good music to y'all. Love y'all. The worst part was Ugly God felt like he couldn't come out and speak about his depression because at the time it was a trend to be depressed or seen as one. Okay, because you talked about in the past year you were going through some depression and so sure. Okay, and you also talked about how 
depression and mental and mental illness has sort of become a catchphrase and something that everyone sort of likes to use. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. So it just, it's got kind of corny. So when I was going through, which is super personal, but when I was going through, it was around the same time becoming depressed and like just being fake depression like that is actually like an aesthetic and like a wave now for a to not even be depressed and then they acting and depressed and shit all on Instagram and when they're really not. So he didn't want to be seen as a fake cloud chaser, so he bottled it up and dealt with it like a man. Another big issue with Ugly God's music early on, and something that negatively affected his career, was being labeled as a mumble rapper on top of the meme rap label, which made it hard for the average rap band to take him and his music seriously. And when Ugly God realized this, he had the equivalent of a midlife crisis for a meme rapper. And in an interview, he said, while my joke around songs are fun to make and turn up to, I'm creating no substance or mark. So he realized none of his music had any meaning and felt like he needed to step it up, which created high expectations for himself, which he couldn't satisfy and resulted in him not dropping music because he didn't feel it was up to par for his new standards. A very vicious cycle. To add to the trouble of that year, Ugly God had put up all the songs that didn't make it to the album in a folder and uploaded it to Dropbox. He then accidentally, I don't even know how you do this, emailed it to a fan who said if he didn't pay him, he would leak 100 plus songs, which Ugly God was not going to pay for. And what would you know, most of them leaked. And to top the year off, his Instagram was taken down after he posted conspiracies on his page. But the worst part was bumps and bruises. His highly anticipated tape just kept getting delayed. Late, and when it finally dropped, it no longer was highly anticipated. The hype had disappeared. In the album were songs like Hello with Lil Pump and Lost in the Sauce, which were cool but not new or meaningful like he expressed he liked his music to be. And he didn't get very much exposure either. It peaked at number 46 on Billboard and sold 14,000 in the first week, which is okay but a flop for his size. And afterwards, he went radio silent. And with the memes taken away from his musicality, fans were not happy. To them, he was just a basic SoundCloud rapper now, with nothing special to add to the table. And to me, this was Ugly God's biggest mistake, because he failed to understand that his humor and meme ability was actually what made him him, and what fans loved so much. When he got rid of that, his music became dull and there was nothing special about it. After bumps and bruises flopped, Ugly God took it hard. This time, he ghosted everyone on social media, only tweeting twice and making one Instagram post in the years afterward. The most attention he got was something he didn't even want attention for. It was when he got arrested after an altercation in front of a hospital. He never addressed it and afterwards, people just forgot very quickly. But in 2021, he had picked up his internet presence once again. By then, his sound had evolved too and he was no longer the meme rapper rapping about the childish things he was rapping about before. He was making an attempt to be more mature. Furthermore, Ugly God had also made it clear he was not trying to be in the spotlight. His YouTube bio wrote, been too busy enjoying myself because I never had shit. He also explained that he wanted to live his life privately, by himself and keeping to himself. Later that year, he also revealed he had a child, and that child was his number one priority. And the only reason he was still doing music was because providing for that child was just as important. In that interview, he said that he was playing basketball, fishing, spending time with his kids, and just living life. And even though he's lost hundreds of thousands of followers, he was fine with that. But at the end of 2021, Ugly God had had it with the falling off allegations, and decided he'd show everyone that he was still making money and doing more than fine. So he posted this screenshot saying, haven't even dropped a single track on any streaming platform since August 2019. My supporters really have my back. 25 million streams on Spotify is roughly $100,000 if you calculate it. And if you count Apple Music, YouTube, and other platforms in streaming, it was clear his income was still in the hundreds of thousands. So good for him. This explains why Ugly God said it didn't matter if he dropped new music or not. Shit, nigga, you ain't dropping the minute. <laughs> Imagine I don't drop music for a whole nother year, bro. Yeah. That hurt nobody, bro. Come on, bro. I know you want me to win this but no, I'm just joking. Because he was no longer popular. His new music couldn't compete numbers wise with his old music. So even if he dropped some new music, his old music would still outstream it. A very weird but fortunate scenario to be in. Later that year in 2021, he made an excuse for why he didn't drop, pointing fingers. Shit just like high school, you feel me, bro? Be around, you know, who the coolest niggas, who the hottest, who around, who all in the scene and shit. Y'all know that's just not me. Which is the opposite of hate the game, not the player. It was the player, or rapper in this case, Ugly God hating the game, which he had to abide to, like everyone else. In 2023, Ugly God randomly dropped a two-track EP, 
One of the songs even featured Lil Yachty, but Yachty and his label took it down. After the incident, Ugly God was furious and took to Twitter saying, Yachty's song got took down. But y'all know how this industry stuff goes. I'm not blaming him for actually reporting it myself, but it wasn't an automatic takedown. And it indeed got reported directly from the label. I'm independent. So this was Ugly God saying that Yachty's record label took it down because Ugly God was independent. On top of all of that, he had gone into legal trouble as well which was the reason he dropped on SoundCloud and not other streaming platforms. It came out that Ugly God's name, Ugly God, was copyrighted by his old manager. So he didn't own the rights to his own name and it was being held hostage by his ex-manager, which is why he was forced to drop the two-pack on SoundCloud, which was then taken down by Lil Yachty. So Ugly God was pretty frustrated. And since then, fans have been saying he's been falling off, writing things like, anyone know what happened to Ugly God? And getting responses like, he fell off. This was a stark contrast from the articles that were being written on Ugly God in the years prior, like how Ugly God took over the internet. So it was clear the narrative had changed and Ugly God was nowhere near as close as big as he once was. But none of this was actually the end of Ugly God's career. The real nail in the coffin, no pun intended, was when Ugly God was responsible for someone else's life. So rapper Ugly God is being officially accused of sh and his best friend's father. In the police report, he is listed as an official suspect. Man, what the f I haven't heard this man's name in years, and this is the first thing I see? I wanted him to drop music, not a body. On June 29, 2023, police reports came out saying somebody went to heaven in Orange Grove, Mississippi. The man was 50 years old. Police responded to the call with the victim slumped in his car and arrested the suspect without any issues. But a little later, news began circulating that Ugly God was responsible for it, and the victim was his best friend's dad. The alleged police report even named Ugly God's government name. People were shocked, as prior to this, it seemed like Ugly God was cool with his best friend's dad. There were pictures of them together for years and years, and apparently Ugly God's mom was living with his best friend's dad and wife for two years. So the whole situation was very confusing. After the situation went down, Ugly God claimed it was self-defense and the victim had threatened his mother. But according to the witnesses, Ugly God and his friends lured the victim, his best friend's dad, back to his house saying his son was in danger, apparently bragging about it. And as the victim was riding away, completely blindsided him by the attack. Afterwards, Ugly God got on live to say he was mad no one had his back. To come on here and for nobody to defend me, was like, uh, and then feeling like everything. He made a tweet saying, a lot can happen in the year, hashtag don't believe the hype. Posted up with a bankroll. And then, in classic Ugly God fashion, disappeared. But the evidence was pretty clear. To most fans, this was the first time they heard Ugly God since Water, so to them, it was a wild crash out story. And it's safe to say that today, Ugly God's chance of making a comeback is very, very slim. He threw away his rap career over some pretty serious charges, and while he did have a chance, never really grabbed the opportunity. And today, Ugly God is just a one hit wonder. The thing is, once you go viral for memes, you have to stay that way to maintain your success. Ugly God wasn't an exception. He no longer was that high school kid. He was a grown man. And wasn't able to continue the meme persona, so he fell off. The next meme rapper who fell off is none other than the 2021 sensation Mario Judah. Back in 2020, Mario Judah took the internet by storm through his viral snippets and just the crazy way he acted. But what set Mario Judah apart was Mario had talent. He was someone who put in the 10,000 hours and seemed like he was willing to put in the effort to market himself too. Today, Mario Judah has lost hundreds of thousands of followers and his only activity is random songs he's forced to post by his label streaming. But at one point, Mario was the most viral artist to pop out of a specific corner of internet rap in a long time, and someone who fans were genuinely excited for and waiting for to drop. So if he had everything in the palm of his hands, what happened and how did he fall off? Well, let's take it back to October of 2020, when Mario had the internet in a chokehold. Twitter and TikTok had taken his music to the next level, and he was even charting on streaming services. But that didn't happen overnight. Mario Judah originally started out as a producer from Atlanta, and didn't even want to become a rapper. Making beats, and being a producer only. And that's all I ever really wanted to do was just be that. Only starting to rap months before everything took off. In the summer of 2020, Mario Judah dropped his song, Die Very Rough, on SoundCloud. A videographer found the song and shot a video for the song to help Mario out. That videographer was J-Law, the same guy who discovered Los Guys. J-Law eventually let Mario sleep in his office and they inked a management deal. J-Law would earn 25% of Mario Judah's earnings. But Mario literally only had a couple hundred followers, so it wasn't a really bad contract. Considering J-Law gave him a career and a real shot. And to their surprise, just a couple of weeks later, a tweet tweeting Mario Judah's music went V-I-R-A-L, viral. 
The memes went crazy and so did the views on the Die Very Rough music video, getting hundreds of thousands of views daily. And Mario Judah seemed to be making a name for himself. During this time, he began getting label offers. First actual money offer was 50 grand. They wanted to Die Very Rough and I think it was like three other songs. Honestly, we kind of laughed at it and was like, nah, that's not enough. But looking back on The second deal was a bit more interesting. The label offered Mario $300,000, $100,000 advance, 100k marketing budget, and 100k for a ski mask feature and a Cole Bennett video, along with a rolling loud performance. It was from one of the many branches at Atlantic, because okay. there's, there's tons of them. It was a hundred grand promise that Cole Bennett would shoot a video and ski mask the slump god would get on the Die Very Rough remix. J-Law later learned they lied about many details of the contract, and the deal was very aggressive retaining most of Mario's music and forcing Mario to drop two EPs, about 10 to 15 songs. So after taxes and J lost 25%, Mario would barely make 40k. So his manager told Mario, hey, let's not take the deal, I'm sure something better will come up. And Mario agreed. However, the next day, Mario was nowhere to be found. And ever since then, Mario and his ex-manager J-Law have never spoke. What happened? It turned out Mario was desperate. He flew to LA that night and signed that deal. So he secretly left and never spoke a word to J-Law. But you see, Mario never got a Cole Bennett video or a Ski Mask feature. He did get a hangout with DJ Scheme though and perform at Rolling Loud. Mario's interview with Drewski went ultra viral and he was just so out of pocket and funny. Even Drewski was like, what's wrong with this guy? But the clip catapulted Mario to another level of fame or level of clout, I should say. Lil Uzi began tweeting him, and for a second, it looked like Mario had actually made the right choice. As although the contract was horrible, it may have been worth it because of all the publicity he was getting. Mario was a master at marketing, and pretty soon, he would become a household name in rap. At the time, Playboy Cardi was on the verge of dropping his long-awaited album, Whole Lotta Red. So like any sane Cardi fan, Mario Judah started threatening Playboy Cardi, saying if Cardi didn't drop Whole Lotta Red, Mario would do it himself. Playboy Cardi! Where's Whole Lotta Red? We want a whole lot of red! If it's not here and delivered to the world before December 6th, I will drop it myself. and started previewing his own Whole Lotta Red songs, which was just Mario rapping on Whole Lotta Red beats. But here's the kicker. A lot of those songs were self-produced by Mario and engineered by Mario. Mario actually had talent. And when he dropped his Playboy Cardi type songs, fans were actually like, yo, the song being a clone aside, this dude's actually pretty good. So the Cardi fanbase began treating Mario like he was their messiah and leading the fight against Cardi to drop music. He was getting so much attention, fans began speculating that Cardi's label hired him to promote their music. But later, people from Cardi's camp began dissing Mario. Ken Carson tweeted, F Mario Judah, and Cardi's hairstylist said, stop glazing. In fact, something very unfortunate which Mario didn't foresee is that Cardi was signed to the same label Mario was signed to. And after Cardi's album went number one, he was definitely a much, 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 much bigger priority over Mario. So to them, it was a very easy decision to shelve him over Cardi, who may have had his management speak to those at Atlantic to have Mario silenced or shelved because that's just how Cardi operates, which was not great for Mario. But Mario did stick to his word and drop his own whole lot of red. But once Cardi dropped his album, Mario's album aged horribly and fans began viewing Mario's album as cheap and just another antic. And the majority of his top songs are from that knockoff whole lot of red album. So he didn't focus on his own music, but chose the meme route instead. To me, this is where his downfall began, as the joke of whole lot of red took over Mario Judah's brand. I'm dropping whole lot of red deluxe for you. And so then the joke, it took over his whole brand. So when he pitched himself for the freshman, one of the top accolades that he had was big, yeah, and whole lot of red. And the fact that somebody else's album is at the top accolades of your career that's when you know you done f***ed up but at the time no one realized this and mario he still had more in the tank he decided to pull up on his cheating ex-girlfriend on instagram live and she took my f***ing heart and you know what the f*** she did with it she f***ing tore it oh f f stop the car bro stop the car hell no nah, bro you f***ing serious this bitch right here with the f***ing are you f***ing serious everyone thought this was real but later he admitted it was fake it actually happened i take things to a different level and i figured you know what I'm going to act out a situation, point of view, and so that it could hit everybody and they could think that everything is real and that everything is happening so that everybody can be sad about it and be like, oh my God, what's going on? And then hit them with the message. Message being, 
you don't cheat because things like this can happen. But again, what- And it was all a marketing gimmick to promote his new song, I Can Love You, a rock rap song. But the song didn't even go viral. And after March of 2021, Mario Judah disappeared for a couple of months. But later that year, a song of Mario's leaked called I Miss the Rage, a play on Trippy Red snippet Miss the Rage. And at the time, fans thought it was a collab with him and Trippy Red, especially after he tweeted I Miss the Rage and Good Morning Ragers. It really seemed like it would drop, and Trippy Red even posted a video of him listening to Mario's song. But eventually, the real version dropped, and it was with Hey, Playboy Cardi. Becoming probably one of the most memorable rap records in the past couple of years, Trippy Red had also said that Mario wasn't on the song, but everyone just ignored him. <laughs> Man, what the f Hey, Mario Judah is not on Mr. Raid. Stop saying. And if you go to the Mario Judah version, the comments are overwhelmingly positive. People actually like the song, so it sucks that we didn't see much from him afterwards. That was in May of 2021, and since then, he's completely faded out of relevance. He hasn't posted or said anything, or done anything, other than dropping a music video with no promotion. He might have been able to reignite his career, but Mario was about to see the ugly side of the music industry. In a Discord call, Mario explained his new management sucked. I had this manager. That was f***ing, man, I ain't even gonna get into that, bro. Not his old manager, Jay Law. This was his new manager, who his old manager tried to protect him from. His new manager was allegedly messing Mario's career up and tried to control him. Mario's old manager was Lil Sky's videographer, and for many others. He had industry experience, but wasn't industry. And most importantly, had Mario's best intentions at heart. A perfect combination. That's that's what I think, and, yeah. and he, since he got out of my situation so easily, I thought, I think that maybe he thought he could do it again, and he signed something, and then kind of realized it wasn't exactly what he wanted. Mario's newer people People, they didn't care about him. It was their way or no way. And from Mario's hiatus, it was clear which route he had taken. After that, Mario dropped an NFT project and people didn't even blame him for the scam. It was just clear he was very broke and needed money. There were supposed to be perks, but nothing ever popped up. And in the Discord call, he didn't really have an answer. Saying, y'all, I, I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta talk to y'all about that soon, man. It ain't really what it seems right now. And to the way he was speaking in the call, it was clear he had lost a sparkle in his eye that he had had when he first came into the industry. You know, we about to record our sideways. We just found somebody who we finna record, finna get a hit made, you know what I mean? Table, you know what I'm saying? We finna record right here, outside. You see that? First, do it. Found my man. I, don't, I don't even know him, bro. What's crazy is it only took like a year for Maria to get thrown out and sent back to the road. Other artists have had label issues. Megan Thee Stallion spoke about label issues, Lil Uzi did, but they spoke out against it and tried to do something. And they were much bigger. Mario didn't even try and went a year without posting. And when he did, he posted a tweet that seemed to be reassuring himself, which basically just showed that he was not in a great mental state. In September of 2023, Mario Judah made a post with some crazy hair. It reminds me of the weekend back during Kissland and told everyone they needed to get baptized and was just showing everyone his faith. He returned with a very weird video of him with overgrown dreads, facial hair, and a menacing stare. That's it. And fans just thought he lost it. It was like we blinked and Mario Judah was gone, which led to fans asking, what the F happened to Mario Judah? There were even articles being written about his disappearance. Which brings us to today, where most of the fans just look back on his stint as one of the funniest 15 seconds of fame in the music industry, which is a shame because of how much work Mario Judah put in. I used to make beats on the side of the street, bro. I recorded homeless people on the side of the street before. Like anybody who walked next to me, you was going to record on the side of the street with me, and I was going to make the beat for it. I just really wanted it bad, so it's a blessing I'm here. Time went on, I started gaining a lot of weight because I wouldn't go outside and like any exercise that's how much i was sitting down being productive making beats so when people make like jokes or whatever like that i actually like i laugh at it and i'm kind of like glad that they say that because they don't know why i got this big or got yeah. this i got this fat because i was sitting down every day making beats working my but not the one outside. He really sacrificed everything. So what happened? I think this fan on Reddit said it best. Mario Ajuda had incredible potential with his career before he disappeared. I'm not joking. He had fantastic vocal range and even sounds like a completely different person in some of his songs. I know everybody thinks he's cringe after seeing the Die Very Rough music video, but they're disregarding all of his other work. He also fits into his genre of music perfectly. His voice just has that aggressive tone to it, amplifying this hybrid of horrorcore and hip hop. He's hardly active on Spotify now, only collaborating with a few small artists occasionally. Had he pursued his independent career further, he could have 100% blown up. To me, what's really sad about artists like Mario Judah and Ugly 
God is in today's day and age, breaking artists in the industry is extremely hard. It's actually the hardest thing to do. And artists like Ugly God and Mario Judah did it themselves and had fans gravitate towards their personalities organically. So it sucks that even after breaking into the industry, they were still spit out. The last rapper on this list is Kid Buu. If you were a fan of SoundCloud rap back in the day, this guy was everywhere. Not everywhere, but he was around. And it wasn't because he was a good rapper. He was just one of the most bizarre rappers around. He would say the craziest stuff and was just a really, 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 really weird guy. And behind it all, he had somewhat of a push. But today, he is non-existent and no longer goes by Kid Buu, completely fallen off. At his peak, he was getting millions of views. So what happened? How did this interesting character go from garnering millions of views, disappear so fast? Hailing from New Jersey, Kid Buu was born in 1988. So he was very old, which he attempted to keep a secret. In 2006, when he was 17 years old, Kid Buu had a kid, and in 2008 was arrested when he did something super messed up to his girlfriend or baby mama I should say at the time in front of the child. He was charged with multiple charges and it's unknown how he spent his 20s reportedly selling toys and making a bunch of money after his two year jail stint. However, he wanted to erase his past and make people think he was younger than he was. So he cut off his childhood friends, deleted his social media, and moved to Toronto, allegedly to dodge child support. However, his first persona wasn't Kid Boo. It was Humongous the God. Yeah, really good name. His strategy was to emulate rappers who were already successful, and he tried to copy Travis Scott, Tory Lanez, and even managed to get Amigos feature before they were as big as they are today, even getting them to appear in the music video, which was probably like $50,000. He just tried everything hoping for something to work, and didn't have an original bone in his body. For example, he used to pay to go on radio shows, and at release parties he would host himself, he paid models to dance around him, and paid extras because he had no fans, which honestly just makes me feel bad for him. At that point, he realized what he was doing wasn't working and completely changed his image as well as his name to what he's most famously known for or as Kid Boo. He took a more thoughtful and tasteful image this time, colorful hair, face tattoos, nail polish, and that whole streetwear rapper aesthetic that was really popular in 2017 with like dreads and stuff. And just like Lil Pump, he would do lame stunts on Instagram as well. At first, he started buying followers all the way up to 100,000, but in 2018, he actually began gaining an organic following. His silly gimmicks began catching on, and people began getting infatuated with the whole Kid Boo character of his. He released multiple songs on Worldstar that did pretty well, some even getting millions of views, but Kid Boo's real big break was when he was on Vlad TV and was interviewed. He basically said he was a second generation clone and that he escaped from a cloning facility. He made up an intricate story saying his chest tattoos were actually symbols from the cloning facility. He was held a hostage in, and the whole thing was really cringe. I was cloned by Clonate in Canada. My model number is 0112568 if anyone wants to see the registration and cloning. Okay. So then you end up in since before escaping, I read that the mother was Puerto Rican and the uh I guess the father is surrogate, you could say, was a uh, disper- But despite how cringe it was, the stunt was huge and got him so much exposure. And today, it's what people really know him for, sitting at 3 million views. And just like his peers in the clout rap scene, he had plenty of stunts. He used an editing trick to make it look like he was with his clone. He paid Black China to be his girlfriend. He attempted to beef with Trippy Red and just got roasted, which I'll get into later. But despite all of the clout chasing activities, for a while, things were going pretty well for him. He modeled for OVO hung out with Trippy Red, collabed with Ski Mask, and Mo Perp. But Kid Boo's weird behavior did finally catch up to him. He started behaving weirdly, going back to his old ways, doing things like putting a tracker under Adam22's car because he wouldn't give him an interview and more. So after all these shenanigans, people eventually started catching on and stopped taking him seriously. He began getting clowned on and just became a joke. Even Ricegum clowned on him. All these weird details started coming out and his past would slowly get uncovered. The first big expose came from his girlfriend at the time who made a huge expose talking about how he was abusive, controlling, manipulative, and lied to her, saying he was 10 years younger than he was and about the fact that he had a child. The funniest thing was he said that he made no money from his music and he just injected money into it to make it seem like he was living a certain lifestyle. It looked like he put a lot of money into, but the music itself wasn't good. I mean, it was honestly terrible and that was one of the things that kind of held me back. I was like, ugh, I have to support this guy's music and I don't even like it. And I'm not even just saying that because he's my ex now. Didn't like it at the time. It turned out he got a nose job and was a 30 year old and in his past career even paid DJ Khaled to do a whole project with him. After that, Boo thought beefing with other rappers would revive his career. Spoiler alert, 
It didn't, and just dug him into a deeper hole. He tried beefing with Nav by re-uploading audio on a two-year-old track with a copy of one of Nav's songs, and then claimed that Nav copied him. Nav never even addressed it. But his best friend Lil Uzi had his back. Apparently, Kid Buu wanted to get into a party, so Uzi invited everyone that was with Kid Buu and told him the only condition was that they had to ditch Kid Buu, which is pretty funny. When Kid Buu asked him why on Twitter, Uzi explained it was for stealing Nav's song. It didn't stop there. Although Trippy Red and Kid Buu were originally friends, Buu and him fell out after Trippy Red wouldn't make a song with him. Which, if you ever listened to a Kid Buu song, if you haven't, just keep it that way you know why. They fell out because Trippy Red allegedly stole a song from Kid Buu. According to Kid Buu, he showed Trippy Red a song of his and then Trippy Red liked it so much he told Buu, yo, wait and I'll put a verse on it. He then remade the song and dropped it, allegedly. Trippy Red told a different story and said that the beat was made in 2018 and Kid Buu really wanted to be on the song but Trippy didn't let him because the beat was made in 2018, you know what I'm saying? Like, they wanted to be on the song. But I kicked him off the song because he was so damn trash. I DM the address. Don't even get no clown no attention, bro. Don't get no hey, clown look. no hey, attention. Hey, look. I ain't giving him no attention. This is the last time I'm going to ever speak on this. Juice World even chimed in and told Trippy not to give him any attention. He had a lot more else too. Boo tried to get a Cole Bennett video. In Toronto, he got his chain stolen and he tried to make the double XL list but didn't make the cut. It was just embarrassment after embarrassment and L after L. And ever since then, Kid Boo has been trying every trick in the book, but nothing's been working. In 2020, Kid Boo was caught copying Playboy Cardi pictures completely, down to the pose and outfit, which I don't know what he was thinking, like it was very easy to catch that. In 2021, Kid Boo was caught faking RIAA certifications, lying that multiple songs of his went platinum. The Photoshop was horrendous as well. It was just unbelievable. Currently, he's trying to fake being a part of Cardi's label, releasing his Pink Planet album where he completely rips off Lil Uzi and self-releasing it under Opium Records and I could just keep listing the L's but I'm gonna stop there. And finally in 2023, Kid Boo admitted he lied about the clone stuff. Yeah, no one was shocked buddy. Today, Kid Boo still posts on his YouTube but he's fallen off the face of the planet and posts vlogs trying to show he's an active father, which I guess is cool. To me, it seems like Kid Boo had some sort of trauma as he was 19 when he went to jail for a couple of years and they say you stay the same age of your trauma. It seems like he did something which I'm really curious about to get all the money he did to fund his music career, sacrificing his youth on top of the jail stint he had. So he was trying to relive his youth by becoming a rapper, getting a nose job, hanging out with girls 10 years younger than him, and lying about his age, of course. So yeah, kind of unfortunate, but he had it coming. It's mostly just funny though. Overall, I see this as just one big lesson. In anything, if you start off as a joke, you're gonna stay a joke and end as a joke. That doesn't apply to just meme rappers either. It's very rare that someone can transition from a meme to having a serious career, and if they do, they have to drop the meme aesthetic completely. Take Pink Guy and Filthy Frank, for example. When Filthy Frank slash Pink Guy became Joji, he had to get rid of that persona for good, to the point where he masked the slum god didn't even realize that Joji was Pink Guy or Filthy Frank when he met in person. Others like Lil Pump and Smoke Perp, who weren't meme rappers but used a lot of gimmicks, also fell off. But at the end of the day, my advice would be to stay away from this type of stuff as much as possible and as far as possible. Of course, making a joke or being lighthearted and funny is cool, but it's best not to make your actual work, your craft, a joke, if that makes sense, because that's just how people are going to treat it. Anyways, that's it for this video. My name is Rashad Fashir. Thanks for watching. Have a nice day and see you next time.